Secretary, um, both in the philosophy of psychiatry, uh, where he's also uh, is the author of a excellent so-called introduction of the essential philosophy of psychiatry, but it's so much more than a textbook. He's also um, co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Philosophy of Psychiatry, uh, and has published a great deal uh, specifically on tacit um, knowledge, but also um, that of narrative understanding as applied to medical diagnosis. Um, Tim has also published extensively in philosophy of language. Um, he's the author of uh, a textbook on John McDowell and philosophy, and also a, he's the author of a book uh, on Wittgenstein on thought and language. More, uh, most recently, he is 2013, I think it was, co-authored a book on tacit knowledge. And you, you know this better than I do. Yes, <laughs> and so on, on that note, uh, so he will enlighten us on that topic today. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that thorough introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I realise that I should perhaps come clean and say that I am an author of a book on Wittgenstein, uh, which was reviewed, I think, by Mary McGinn, uh, in something like the following way. She said, if you want uh, an anachronistic book that reads theories into the later Wittgenstein, then I suppose this may be the book for you. But why on earth would you want any such thing? So I, I just wanted to get that off, <coughs> off my chest so you know where, where I am or was coming from. Uh, this is a... I hope I'm not going to say fun too much. Uh, this is, they have done it again. This is a, 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 a paper on tacit knowledge that I wrote yesterday. Uh, I could tell you my uh, uh, Kale Isla, John McDowell story, if that might help. Uh, that th uh, There was a conference on McDowell at Warwick University, and I was just so cool. I thought, I won't bother writing my paper until the very last minute, on the third, for the third day of the conference. Uh, and we had the conference dinner the, the night before, and I stayed up drinking with Charles Travis, who is a mean drinker. Uh, and then I cycled home and I, I was not motivated to write at all. So, so I began writing it, and I got out a bottle, I can never know how you pronounce it, Kale Isla, the uh, uh, nice, smoky, peaty Scottish whiskey. And I began, I began drinking and I began writing, and in the end I went to bed quite satisfied, a third of the bottle had gone, uh, but I'd finished the presentation. I showed up the next morning, and with, with the exuberance of youth, I boasted how I'd written the paper. Well, the slides were okay for the first third, but then in the middle third, the spelling began to go a bit awry. And by the, th the final third, it was kind of gibberish. And I was just making it up on the hoof. And John McDowell coughed politely and said, I think, I think probably at that point, you've had a little bit too much of the <laughs> Carl Isla. And I realized that my academic career had just gone up in smoke in front of me. So I, I wrote this yesterday, and I'm kind of worried. It was post-cocktail hour. Uh, so I'm suddenly worried this morning that... Uh, it, it won't be as coherent as I might have hoped it would be. But here's, here's the plan. Ooh, sorry. Here's the plan. I want to say, first of all, something about why we might want to think about tacit knowledge, why I'm interested in tacit knowledge in the first place, and something about the history of the idea of defining, of thinking about tacit knowledge by thinking about what it isn't. So tacit knowledge standing in opposition to <coughs> explicit knowledge. So that's the sort of starting point. And then I'm, I'm basically going to talk a lot about uh, Harry Collins's book, Tacit and Explicit Knowledge, that came out a few years before my own book on the subject. And it's filled with really interesting stuff, but at the same time, I don't understand it. And what I want to do is try and give you an account of why I don't, under, why I don't understand it, and suggest that it's because it falls prey to a real problem in thinking about tacit knowledge, uh, which is in thinking about tacit knowledge, we need an account which is both tacit and knowledge. At this point, I usually say, uh, and that's why I deserve my professorial salary, uh, for any account of tacit knowledge, it's got to be tacit, it's got to be knowledge. But there's a tension between those two notions. So I'm going to describe, by going through these stages, Collins's uh, book, and I'm going to suggest that the problem with it is that the knowledge status of tacit knowledge goes missing. He ends up focusing on worldly processes, on ontology rather than epistemology. And then at the end, I'm going to suggest something about uh, some sort of alternative to try and balance this tacit and knowledge status in tacit knowledge. I'm going to suggest that we should think of tacit knowledge as context-dependent, conceptually structured, practical knowledge. 
And then very finally, and I'm worried in, this, in these surroundings uh, with a history of Wittgenstein scholarship uh, in previous years going before me, I'm going to suggest that, that in a sense the issue of tacit knowledge sits with our difficulties in thinking about what is, what is and isn't explicit in Wittgenstein's rule following considerations. So that, that's going to be the kind of, but at that point I'm afraid to say I'm just going to fail, I'm just going to finish. That, I'll just stop talking. It'll be a bit like, if, do you remember the film The Battle of Britain? Mm -hmm. All the way through the uh, fighter pilots have been playing cards on an airfield and, and a bell has rung because the Germans are coming over and they've zipped up and there, there are then these rather <coughs> glorious battles. And this, the film is of an episodic nature uh, but it finishes with them playing cards uh, on the battlefield and then nothing happens and then the credits roll because I guess that's how the Battle of Britain ended. But you can't help feeling that as a film it's a bit of an anti-climax. Well, I'm just going to stop talking. At that point, you'll just have to think of me as playing cards on the airfield and the Germans not coming over. Okay. That's perhaps overly long. I, I realise there's no, there's no clock in this room. Uh, and also, I've been given two hours. I have a sudden fear that this might be like Heidegger's lectures on boredom, <laughs> which famously went on for hour upon hour upon hour, instilling the very mood that he was describing. So... Why should we think about tacit knowledge in the first place? Well, let me just remind you of some of the, 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 the obvious examples uh, of tacit knowledge, putative examples of tacit knowledge. Chicken sexing is the famous one. And let me tell you what I understand to be the correct story and then remind you about how philosophers <coughs> think about it. So I understand that the correct story is that in the 1920s or 30s, the Japanese discovered a good way of telling the difference between male and female chicks. And it's utterly vital to do that really early on in the chicken industry because you don't want to feed the male chicks. So there's somebody who stands with a large lavatory just flushing the male chicks down the loo as quickly as possible, as early as, as early as possible in their lives. But it's quite difficult to tell the difference because they both look the same. The Japanese, however, invented a practical method which involved squeezing and looking that could be taught in about six weeks. Having done the course, one was quite proficient, but proficiency rose for the next six months reaching in the end something like 1,400 chicks an hour with 98% success. <coughs> Visiting Australians from the Australian <coughs> chicken industry went over and couldn't see how it was done. And I suspect it was because they couldn't be bothered to do the six-week course. You can imagine a kind of neo-colonial attitude, thinking, we're not going to take a course, we're Australians. <laughs> uh, but without that, they weren't able to see in the practical manipulation that the Japanese chick sexes were carrying out nor were they able to hear in the words of the Japanese what was being seen so as to tell the difference between these two things. You needed to have eyes to see. That, I think, is the truth of the story. The interesting thing is the way we philosophers tell it, we add the further embellishment that neither was it the case that the, Jap the Japanese chick sexers knew how they were doing it. I, I found nothing in the literature to support <coughs> that, but that makes it kind of more interesting, doesn't it, as a notion of tacit knowledge. You have knowledge, and you yourself are mystified by the nature of your own knowledge. But I don't think we need to think of, think of that. It's interesting that that philosophical story is so in, in, ingrained that in one of the reviews of my co-authored book on tacit knowledge, in which I mention this and tell the stories I've just told it to you, the reviewer says, and the Japanese ch chicken sexes didn't know how they were doing it. Well, I didn't say that, but that's just what we assume. The Polynesian navigators can navigate across the complicated waters of Polynesia on the basis of cues which include wind and tide and wave shape and so on. But they can't give a context-independent account of this back at base to visiting anthropologists. And let me now make the following bit up. I can imagine that the visiting anthropologists they're not going to get into the, into the little boats. There's no way they're going to get into the little boats and have a practical demonstration of how it goes on. But back on land, the navigators aren't able to say why it is that sometimes the tide is important and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes the waves are important and sometimes they're not. Those are context-dependent judgments about the competing epistemological factors. But the reason that I got into, was it became interested in tacit knowledge, was Harry Collins' work, 
uh, I did my PhD in the HPS faculty in Cambridge uh, in the late 80s and 90s. And Harry Collins was much talked about by the sociologists there. And I think the thing that we found most interesting was his account of the TEA laser. Now, one of these days, I'm going to remember what TEA stands for before Stan Geffen giving a talk. Transverse uh, electrical... Is that even the word? <coughs> no, anyway. New form of laser. So here's the story. New form of laser has been theoretically devised. Uh, the results of the theory have been published, and some of them have been made practically and made to work. And th those details have been published too. But Collins discovered in the 1970s that no one was able, just by reading the description of the theory and the description of the pre-existing lasers, no one was able to build a working laser. The only way you got to build a working laser was if you had hands-on practical experience with someone else who'd already done it. And for this, that reason, he described this as a piece of tacit knowledge. Okay. No scientist, he said, no scientist succeed in building a laser by using only information found in published or other written sources. Thus, every scientist who managed to copy the laser obtained a crucial component of the requisite knowledge from personal contact and discussion. I should say there's one other interesting thing in, in, his, in his description of this, which is in his book, Changing Order, which is a wonderful, wonderful book, and I highly recommend it. Uh, one of the people that he investigates is a scientist called Bob Harrison, who has successfully built a working laser and has taken on the task of building a second working laser. And he finds this deeply difficult. And I think that is part of the reason for this rather highly charged account of tacit knowledge that we get in the second paragraph here. So standing back from his description of this, Colin says, in sum, the flow of knowledge was such that first it travelled only where there was personal contact with an accomplished practitioner. Second, its passage was invisible, so that scientists did not know whether they had the relevant expertise to build a laser until they tried it. Third, it was so capricious that similar relationships between teacher and learner might or might not result in the transfer of knowledge. These characteristics of the flow of knowledge make sense if a crucial component in laser building ability is tacit knowledge. Now, at the time, in changing order, Collins doesn't give us a, a sort of a theory of tacit knowledge. The, the, the theory is, as it were, manifest in the examples. Uh, so that prompts the question, sort of, what do we mean by tacit knowledge? If we're motivated to think that there might be such a category which is anthropologically relevant in discussions of chicken sexes, uh, Polynesian navigators, and 1970s working scientists... If we think that tacit knowledge is an interesting concept, what kind of concept is it? What, what, what does it amount to? Now, I should say that tacit, doing the philosophy of tacit knowledge isn't like doing the philosophy of knowledge, where, roughly speaking, there's a great source of non-collusive evidence. Evidence is obviously the wrong word, but in the <coughs> way in which we use the word knowledge, <coughs> the subject matter of linguistic and uh, epistemological analyses. In the case of tacit knowledge, to some extent we're stipulating it, because it isn't a category in widespread <coughs> use, although, as I say, it is it, uh, used by Collins and, and others in, in academia. And it comes from uh, <coughs> Polanyi. So it's worth me mentioning, oh, Polanyi, a chemist turned philosopher of science here in, in Manchester. And I think there are a couple of things that Polanyi says which are in particular interesting and pregnant for thinking about tacit knowledge. So the first of them is what I think initiates what I want to think of as the via negativa in thinking about tacit knowledge. He says rather boldly, I shall reconfigure human knowledge by starting from the fact that we know more than we can tell. <coughs> and then there's another suggestion, back to which I will come later on in the talk, which comes from his book, Personal Knowledge, where he describes knowledge in this way. He says, I regard knowing, which in the book is, is stressing the personal element of this, a, a, a kind of uh, a rebuttal of, of what he takes to be overly objectivist accounts of knowledge from the positivist's account of science, perhaps. He says, I regard knowing as an active comprehension of things known, an action that requires skill. I'll come back to that later. To begin with, I want to start with the, with the 
uh, no more than we can tell. Slogan. Because this raises some questions. What do we mean by it? Does it carry, for example, a sotto voce qualification at any particular time? Does it mean ever? How do we unpack that slogan? And Polanyi himself immediately goes on to give this example. It's in the, the following sentence. He says, this fact seems obvious enough, but it's not easy to say exactly what it means. Take an example. We know a person's face and can recognize it among a thousand, indeed among a million. Yet we usually cannot tell how we recognize a face we know. So most of this knowledge cannot be put into words. So again, an interesting practical example. But under what under what description? Tacit knowledge is not explicit, we might say, but what do we mean by explicit if that's what we do say? And Collins, in his 2010 book, Tacit and Explicit Knowledge, about which I'm now going to talk almost exclusively, comments right at the beginning. He says, the tension between is not and cannot, in the more than we can tell, cannot tell, cannot be made explicit, permeates the entire discussion. So that's, the, that's a thing to think about. That's... That's the clue. And so I think what, what, what often goes on here is something a bit like, I mean, this is a, this is a feeble analogy, really, forgive me, but uh, the via negativa in theology, the, the idea that any of our accounts of God are going to be corrupted by the fact that we are finite beings. So our, our concepts will inherit our own finiteness. So any attempt to delimit the nature of God will inherit ungodly limits from us. That's, that's the thought. Anyone here who came because they hoped that I was going to talk about the via negativa will be thinking, oh my goodness, is that all he means by it? And I'm afraid to say, that is indeed all I mean by it. I'm not going to talk about uh, the via negativa in theology at all. Just the idea that light can be, sh the analogy goes, light can be shed on God by thinking what God is not. And the approach to tacit knowledge is to say, light is shed on tacit knowledge by saying what it's not. It's not explicit. Well, what do we understand what do we understand by explicit? And Collins has, a, has a, a, an equivalent. It's on the very, the, very first, the very first page. He says, of course, if we're going to say why things cannot be explicated, we, have, we first have to understand what's meant by explicated. That gives rise to the structure of this book, he says. Explain explicit, then classify tacit. So Collins is doing, is, is doing this thing which I think is terribly helpful and useful. And, and now let me say very positive things about the book. It's a weird book. It's a weird book, but lots of it really interesting. And I'm not going to talk about it. So that's most unfair of me. Uh, the structure, in case you're, you're going to go and, and read it, uh, is chapters one to three are his discussion of explicitness. And so in a sense, I think of this as exemplifying this, this via negativa approach. He's going to describe what explicit is, in order that this can give rise to some conceptions of what's tacit. And then chapters four to six examine three kinds of tacit knowledge. And in this, he's giving us a positive story. He says, let me, let me describe to you relational tacit knowledge, somatic tacit knowledge, and collective tacit knowledge, which interestingly, he describes as weak, medium, and strong in virtue of their tacitness, in virtue of their resistance to being made explicit. They are weak, medium, and strong in respect to this via negativa, this, this contrast case. He says these adjectives referring to the degree of resistance to being made explicit. Uh, so and then the, the, the basis of the via negativa in the book is that first of all, he sets up the contrast between tacit and explicit. And then because of the, the, the idea that I've already mentioned, that it's the, the difference between is not explicit and cannot be explicit, which permeates the, the, uh, uh, the discussion. He connects explicit to explicable. And then he offers us four distinct meanings of explicable. So these are four distinct antonyms to tacit. We can provide explication in any of these four ways. Elaboration, transformation, mechanization, and explanation. And perhaps elaboration is the closest to explicit in a, in a more everyday sense. If you make something explicit by making it clear, then perhaps elaboration is the notion there that's doing the work. Now, 
here's the thing. I'm not really going to tell you what these, these notions mean, which is most unfair of me. This talk is already going to be long enough, uh, and I really owe you an account of that. But it'll, something will be hinted at in the next few slides through the notion of transformation, mechanization, and explanation. And then later, for any of you who haven't read this book, I will reveal the rabbit from the hat as to what's driving Collins in thinking about uh, making, making things explicit in this particular way. So, so there's a, there's partly I'm just being lazy and not saying more about this, partly there's not enough time, but partly it's because I've had to tell you about his key ontological category, the thing that makes this book such an eccentric book, and I'm going to come back to that in about, I don't know, 10 minutes. So let me, again, and here I am, I'm just trying to drive up sales of the book, feeling guilty that I downloaded it this morning from the Russian illegal download site. <laughs> Maybe we should expunge that from the record. But I do own a copy as well, but I, I realised I didn't have one with me. Uh, so let me get still part of uh, trying to persuade you to buy the book. It's really interesting. Here, these are just from the very beginning, his, his preliminary summaries in advance of three forms of tacit knowledge, back to which I'm not going to come. So, so relational tacit knowledge. Relational tacit knowledge is tacit, he says, for reasons that are not philosophically profound, but have to do with the relations between people that arise out of the nature of social life. The reasons range from deliberate secrecy to failure to appreciate someone else's need to know. A characteristic of weak tacit knowledge is that, in principle, with enough effort, any piece of it could be rendered explicit. That not all of it can be rendered explicit at any one time has to do with logistics and the way societies are organised. So if somebody were trying to sell you a notion of tacit knowledge and they offered you this, then this is rather a feeble notion of, of what it is for something to be tacit. It just means it isn't yet explicit. Uh, but, I mean, in, in, in a spirit of thoroughness, uh, uh, Collins devotes a chapter to this. More interestingly, for those of us who are interested in things like bicycle riding and other examples from Polanyi, is somatic limit tacit knowledge. Uh, and this he describes again at the beginning of the book as he says it's tacit because of the way it's inscribed in the material of body and brain. Somatic limit tacit knowledge is knowledge that cannot be written out at least in principle, sorry, that can be written out at least in principle, but cannot be used by humans because of the limits of their bodies. In general, machines of the right design can execute somatic limit tacit knowledge. We'll come across an example of this, but if we were to give you a formula for how to steer a bicycle, uh, a scientific account of it. The thought is that that wouldn't help us. Supposing I give it to my young son, little Ludwig, who's still feebly failing to balance his balance bike, and I say, look, Ludwig, you need to use the following formula. It's not, it's not, I slap him around a bit, I push him on the bike, he goes down the hill, he crashes. It's, it's not going to be very helpful. But the thought is that's only in principle. Uh, I hand it to the son I always wished I had, little Ludwig's robotic cousin, largely made of silicon and metal, and for that little beastie, it works perfectly well. So, so the thought is it's merely contingent that uh, this is a form of explicit knowledge that wouldn't help us. And then what Collins is really interested in, and I, I feel so guilty that I'm not going to talk about this at all, is collective tacit knowledge. This is strongly ta tacit, because in principle, it can't be made explicit, he says. The knowledge that the individual can acquire only by being embedded in society. This is called strong because we know of no way to describe it or to make mechanisms that can, pos that can possess or even mimic it. Strong tacit knowledge is a property of society rather than the individual. The individual being a parasite on society can learn it, however. And in the book, there's a, there's a notion uh, of social Cartesianism to describe this. So... Collins is committed to a notion that we are fundamentally different from non-minded creatures insofar as we're, we're capable of possessing this collective linguistic tacit knowledge. Okay, so it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Why don't you go off and read that? But I don't understand the book because I don't understand the fundamental tone of what's going on through the use of the via negativa. So, to repeat, it seems to me intuitive that any decent account of tacit knowledge has to meet these two criteria. It's, it's got to render an account of tacit knowledge which is tacit and which is still knowledge. 
And these seem, on the face of it, to be in some sort of tension. Uh, and the reason for that is, when one thinks about ascribing to somebody some knowledge, we're ascribing something that they know, <coughs> some content that's known to them. But as soon as we've ascribed a content, then that seems to make it interesting, odd, strange, difficult, that that isn't rendering that knowledge explicit. So ensuring the tacit status of tacit knowledge threatens evacuating it of any possible content, because it's as though we've got to gesture at, at, at a content in some sense without articulating it, without demonstrating what a dollop of it looks like. And that, I think, is the, that's the difficulty. Uh, and in the main, people who write about tacit knowledge struggle with, with this, as, 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 as I do myself. Uh, and one of the, the, the things that sometimes happens, and this is uh, an instance of it happening to uh, Harry Cohen, uh, is one can overly stress the tacit, get the tacit bit right, but thus fail to account for the knowledge bit. So in a, uh, in a popular introduction to tacit knowledge in, in The New Scientist in 2010, the same year that the book Tacit and Explicit Knowledge came out, uh, Collins provides us with this, this snappy little uh, account. He says, you may not know what you need to know, and I may not know what I know. So that's a, a sort of a, an echo of Polanyi, I suppose, coming through. Uh, and then he gives us this example. Thus, in the early days of TEA lasers, Scientists did not necessarily know that the inductance of the top lead, so the wire at the very top, that the inductance of the top lead was important. But by copying existing designs, they built in successful short top leads without knowing why. So the idea was that initially they built the, the top lead, which was, looked just like a wire on the circuit diagram. They, they didn't worry too much about the length, but it turns out that it's crucial that you have a really short top lead because it's crucial that you have a small inductance. And Colin says, by copying existing designs, they built in successful short top leads without knowing why. Now, my worry is that this plays up the tacit, but it kind of undermines the knowledge. It's not clear that anybody knew that the inductance of the top lead was important, tacitly or otherwise. It's not clear that they knew that it had to be a short lead. They just copied it. So there's a worry I have in general, which is stressing, stressing the tacit threatens to uh, undermine the, the, the knowledge status. And here's another e example in which we get, we're getting a, a bit of a hint of that coming through, but we're also getting the first hint of my main worry about the book, Tacit and Explicit Knowledge, which is that the focus isn't on knowledge at all. Knowledge goes missing because it isn't really what Collins is interested in. Uh, and so I'm sort of approaching this sideways on. So still in the same New Scientist article, written at the same time, but different, different thing, and written only for a popular audience, of course, so this isn't a definitive statement, but I think it's a helpful clue. Uh, Collins writes the following. He says, in the logic of tacit, tacit inference, Polanyi argues persuasively that humans do not know how they ride a bicycle. But he also provides a formula. In order to compensate for a given angle of imbalance, we must take a curve on the side of the imbalance of which the radius r should be proportionate to the square root of velocity v over the imbalance. And here we have a nice, a nice formula. While no human can actually ride a bike using that formula, a robot with much faster reactions might. And then here's the interesting comment he says at the end. So that aspect of bike riding is not quite so tacit after all. And here's what's, what seems to me to be striking about that, is, is supposing that I give little Ludwig uh, a balance bike from that excellent company, Isla Bikes. A friend has just gone to work there, so I should put that plug in. Uh, Isla Bikes, who make the middle-class balance bikes that uh, is, uh, are so loved uh, in Britain these days. You don't have to worry about the pedalling, you just concentrate on the balancing. So imagine little Ludwig, he's got his balance bike, he goes out, there's the steep hill, I live in Kendall, lots of steep hills. He goes whizzing down, he falls off, he breaks his nose, he plastered him back up together, he put him back on, he does it again. Eventually, he gets the hang of it. Has he got tacit knowledge of how to ride a bike? Well, my inclination would be to say yes. He's, he's acquired a piece of know-how that he can't put into words. He knows more than he can tell, perhaps. But it's not as tacit as all that, according to, to uh, 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 Collins, because somewhere else this formula exists. And that suggests there's a strange notion of what's the knowledge here 
that we're focusing on. It doesn't seem to be little Ludwig's knowledge. It doesn't seem to be the knowledge of the actual cyclist. So the formula's part of an explanation of cycling. Making a robot ride a bicycle is a piece of mechanization. Earlier I flagged up that these were two of Collins's uh, uh, treatments of explication in his book. So knowledge is explicable, stroke explicit, in two of the four senses of Collins's book. So the tacit status of human knowledge of how to write a book is affected, is reduced by its explication by other people elsewhere. There's a kind of action at a distance on little Ludwig's tacit knowledge by the fact that uh, Palo Alto scientists have got a robot that's riding a bicycle following this, this formula. Okay, so let me try and give you some... Uh, uh, I'm going to focus really on uh, uh, one example in the book, but, but uh, there's a hint of something else. Uh, and in a sense, this is really unfair. It's a long book, and I'm just focusing on one bit of it. But I think it, it permeates his thinking, and we'll get to why it does when I pull the rabbit of the interesting ontological category out of the hat in about five minutes. We're, we're doing okay? Yes. I meant spiritually, we're doing okay? <laughs> We do, despite the crazy chair layout and so on. Are you making friends and having conversations? No. Oh, oh well, next time. <laughs> Lovely. Um, okay. So let me let me give you an instance of the way in which I think in the book the focus moves away from knowledge uh, onto onto something else. So he says. In all the ways that do not involve the way we intentionally choose to do certain acts and not others, the human per individual body and brain is continuous with the animal and physical world. We are just like complicated cats, dogs, trees, and sieves. When doing these things, yes, I did say that, sieves. Uh, when doing these things, we are just complicated sets of mechanisms which become mysterious only if we try to describe our experiences, try to describe our experiences, to make them explicit. Sometimes we can do things better than cats, dogs, trees and sieves can do them, and sometimes worse. A sieve is generally better at sorting stones than a human, as a fridge is better at chilling water. A tree is certainly better at growing leaves. Dogs are better at being affected by strings of smells, and cats are better at hunting small animals. If we were to stop talking and just get on with things, that is, if the tacit was not made mysterious by its tension with the explicit, there would be no puzzle at all about the body per se. So, okay, now, I do have a caveat, there's a caveat in my account of Collins. It'd be unfair simply to put this quote up, I'm going to give you the caveat, and then I'm going to say something... Uh, following on from this. Here's, here's the caveat. So Collins, as a good linguistic philosopher that he is, says, the idea of tacit knowledge only makes sense when it's in tension with explicit knowledge, and since cats and dogs and sieves and trees cannot be said to know any explicit knowledge, they shouldn't be said to know any tacit knowledge either. In fact, they don't know anything. In some animal trees and sieves should not be said to have tacit knowledge. So that's on the table. But it seems to be a kind of bolt-on, because there doesn't seem in, in Collins's philosophical framework to be a rationale for it. So here's the caveat. The caveat is, on the one hand, uh, uh, pragmatically, we shouldn't say that sieves have tacit knowledge. But when we're concentrating on what it is that we do as humans, aside from our ability to choose <coughs> to sort stones. Forget our choosing, just think about our actual sorting of stones. What we're doing is continuous with what the sieves do. And this is put forward in a book on tacit knowledge to help shed light on the nature of tacit knowledge. So I, I want to flag the caveat. He he's not going to say that sieves have tacit knowledge, but we have tacit knowledge when we do what sieves do, do in virtue of that continuity. And here's a way of sort of kind of showing this somewhat more in operation. So he takes the example of, uh, in, in a discussion with Dreyfus, he takes an example of typists, human typists, whose performance slows down when they concentrate on the rules that they originally used to learn how to type. When they become proficient, 
concentrating on the rules uh, undermines things. This is a, a bit like the, the, the example that Dreyfus uses in his di discussion with McDowell about the, the guy who bowls a ball, throws a ball, pitch, pitches a ball, pitches a ball, you've been to Philadelphia, pitches a ball in a game of American baseball. Baseball, you're vaguely American. Yeah. Uh, so, so the famous Drake using the example of the person who, uh, begin, beginning to concentrate on how he was doing, became utterly rubbish at pitching the ball. So we had an example of this with, with, uh, with cyclists. Uh, now Collins's point about response to this thought, this Dreyfusian thought, he says, this seems to bear on nothing but the way humans work. So he plays down it, the importance of this phenomenological feature that paying attention to the rules undermines our proficiency. It does not bear on the way knowledge works. Note the contrast between the way humans work and the way knowledge works. <coughs> and the reason for that, I think, is that what he's actually interested in isn't knowing how to type, it's the process of typing, however that comes about. So he says, we humans generally type as fast or efficiently when we're paying attention to the keys, but that's just us. So, say it again with the word not in it. We humans cannot generally type as fast or efficiently when we're paying attention to the keys, but that's just us. An automated typing machine that scanned print that was set out in a clear and undamaged font transformed it into editable, editable text and then typed it out again, could work as fast as any human typist and faster if desired. The constraints on the methods available for efficient typing by humans, by contrast with machines, are somatic, like bodily limits. They have everything to do with us and nothing to do with the task as a task, nothing to do with knowledge as knowledge. Note the assimilation of task and knowledge there. So... The notion of knowledge that he's focusing on is not what's had by a human typist. That's not relevant to his concern here. So in, in articulating the human typist's tacit knowledge, he's not thinking about what we might be thinking about when we're thinking about their tacit knowledge. He's thinking about the execution of the process, that thing which is continuous between the human typist and the robot, in the way that sorting stones is continuous between humans and sins, and in the way in which, although one should not say that trees have tacit knowledge how to know how to grow leaves, still, trees growing leaves is relevant to human tacit knowledge in the book. So, since for Collins, this is me, since for Collins, mechanisation makes things explicit, explanation and mechanisation elsewhere has an action at a distance on the nature of the typist knowledge. It's less tacit whether or not they know anything at all about the explanation and the mechanisation. So, okay, and one more thing. Here's page 80. So we've got to the end of the three chapters which are about making, which are about discussing explicitness, explication. And on page 80 he says, we are now in a position to explain the tacit and the explicit. That which is not explicit knowledge is mostly and this is a real surprise, just the way the world unfolds. That which is not explicit knowledge is mostly just the way the world unfolds. I guess it depends on where, where the focus goes. If you're thinking, I mean, in a sense, what, that, that's kind of correct. Let's, let's think of the, 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 the totality of facts as divided between those things which are to do with human explicit knowledge and everything else. Well, I guess most of everything else is mostly just the way the world unfolds. But I take it in the context that the, uh, the, the focus is on explicit knowledge, with the contrast being tacit knowledge. And so the thought that in, in explicating tacit knowledge, in shedding light on tacit knowledge, that which is not explicit knowledge is mostly just the way the world unfolds. Sometimes it's referred to as tacit knowledge. Much of it consists of the working out of mechanical sequences of greater, cats, dogs, humans as animals, paint sprayers, and all that, or lesser, trees, sieves, complexity. For most of this, the term tacit knowledge should not be used, the notion of mechanism being more appropriate. Now, I think at the point that we've got to the end of, of, these, of these three chapters, we've lost knowledge. Now, knowledge will come back in the accounts of, of, uh, of the, the three forms of tacit knowledge in the next chapters. But as a fundamental account of the nature of tacit knowledge, it may be tacit, but it's no longer knowledge. It's process. It's 
things going on. It's the way the world unfolds. We've lost knowledge, it seems. Okay, so where... So we're there. Are we still... We're there. We're still okay? I kind of have the feeling that we ought to pause. Sing a song. <laughs> um, here's the bit where I want to tell you a little bit about the, the interesting thing that I should have mentioned earlier because it happens much earlier in the book. But it's kind of, it's, it's I don't know, it's, uh, uh, this is a book about ontology. You didn't know that you wanted a book about ontology, but you do, because it's a book about process, not knowledge. And one of the things it's about, it's about strings. So strings. Strings are, Bits of stuff, second paragraph down, bits of stuff inscribed with patterns. They might be bits of air with patterns of sound waves, or bits of paper with writing, or bits of the seashore with marks made by waves, or patterns of mould, or, interestingly, almost anything. Now, why, why am I suddenly telling you about strings? Well, because explicit, first paragraph, is something to do with something being conveyed as a result of strings impacting on things. So, do you remember the idea was to make to, to look at explicit, make explicit explicit, and that will help fix the tacit. Well, to make explicit explicit, we have to think what it is that conveys explicit knowledge. And Collins has opted for strings as the thing that does that, a more general category than signs, with the hope, I think, that this will carve out the maximal space for explicit <laughs> knowledge and thus narrowly focus the lens of what's left over as tacit knowledge. Uh, why focus on strings? Well, strings, strings are, whoops, strings are less problematic. I think that's the thought. Strings are without meaning. So, thought of as a string, a book is a physical thing, not a meaningful thing. He says, a string is just a physical object, and it's immediately clear that whether it has any effect and what kind of effect this might be is entirely a matter of what happens to it. So it's a, it's a as, the, as the Americans might put it, it's a naturalistic notion, naturalistic in the sense of reductionist naturalism. Uh, and you might be worried that that's going to make what's conveyed as explicit knowledge look very similar to sort of the cause and effect brute happenings of the world, given that strings include patterns on beaches and more or less anything else. And indeed, that's the case. Uh, string transformations and mechanical causes and effects are, to speak metaphysically, just two aspects of the same thing. That's why we have a strong sense that when we explain some process scientifically, we've made it explicit. And this is the explicable part of the antonym of tacit with its scientifically explained connotation. But my worry now is, if, if the explicit is what's conveyed by strings, and if strings blur into mechanical causation, What's left of the tacit? Because pretty much anything bumping into something else is going to count as mechanical causation. And that's going to count as string transformation. And that's going to be what's explicit. But just a few minutes ago, I suggested that the opposite of explicit knowledge was mostly just the way the world unfolds. But now it seems that mostly just the way the world unfolds is also going to be Explicit knowledge. This is the bit where I have to just say, I, I'm, I feel at sea, I'm losing my grip. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm a reliable uh, guide to, to, to the book. I, I, I do want to, I want to give you that caveat. Other guides to this book are no doubt available. <laughs> my worry, though, is that he selected the wrong antonym for tacit. And because of that, we end up with a focus not on knowledge, but on process. Now, why has he done that? Why, why tell us about strings? Well, here I think the thought is that he's worried about meaning. He talks about the, the freight of inherent meaning that makes the notion of signs, symbols, and icons so complicated. So we can avoid the complexities of meaning, the complexities of thinking about signs and symbols. We can avoid those by going, as it were, all Quinean. And we, we think instead about patterns of stuff that's going to be the way that we, we avoid that. 
And so we get this contrast between meaning on the one hand and strings on the other. A language is a set of meanings located in a society, whereas to repeat, strings are just physical objects. So if meanings in society are complicated things to study and to think about and philosophize about, better surely is the thought to concentrate on decent, honest, physical stuff, strings, bits of stuff with patterns. Now, there's going to be a problem here, because if, this, if the book is going to address, in some sense, what we, we also mean by explicit knowledge in, in less metaphysically charged environments, we might want to think about meaning, because that's one of the ways in which we make things explicit. We, dis we describe them, we put them into words. Polanyi again. So, so there's going to be some potential connection between strings and meaning. But that's going to be a big ask, and there's, there's a, a dollop of modesty in the book about how much Collins himself can provide us with the route back from strings to meaning when we want that. So, so to repeat, that, I think the thought is, meanings are really complicated. Let's do the philosophy of tacit knowledge without talking about meanings. Let's get it clear by talking about strings. But we will need some occasional use of meanings, because that's sometimes what we mean by explicit knowledge. And so he said... Strings are sometimes used to represent meanings. But he says, though they're sometimes used to represent meanings, their relationship to meanings can't be stabilised. And then this is something, I, I don't know, I, I went through a phase, uh, and this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, I, I, it sounds as though I think it's a frivolous thing to do, but I went through a phase of reading the later Heidegger. Um, it was just great stuff, all that fourfold unity and so on, just lovely. Um, and I get a little, a little sense a little sense of Heidegger, because meaning is continually changing as it lives its life in society. You didn't, you didn't know that, but that's where meaning is. It's living its life in society. A, a delightful autonomy going on there. That's the reason why we can't stabilise string meaning. It's because pesky meaning is changing its mind as it lives its life in society. Uh, why the fear of meaning? Well, I think this goes back to... Uh, uh, Collins is real interest in, the, in, in Wittgenstein and, and rule following. And he comments in a footnote on page 46 of this book, rules can never contain all the rules for their own application, but each new rule requires another to explain it, the, the rules regress. And I think that's the reason that he's got this worry. Now, I want at the very end, in about 12 minutes, to pop back and say something about tacit knowledge and, and rule following. That's the bit where it gets all embarrassing and I kind of sit down and wish I had some fellow airline pilots to be playing cards with. We'll get to that. But he does owe us something about the connection between strings, strings and meaning. And this is the bit where, where there's a kind of caveat, but, but kind of more research needed. Instead of saying capable of being interpreted, interpreted about a string, Colin says, I'll adopt the term affords the interpretation, which carries the implication that there's something in the string that makes it easy to interpret one way rather than another. What afford does not mean is determine. The term afford and affordance are lazy terms which merely paper over deep cracks in our understanding, or at least my understanding, of why, given the extraordinary interpretive capabilities of humans, any, anything affords any one interpretation better than any other. How are meanings ever fixed or even favoured? And so there's a, in a sense, this is just left hanging as, as a piece for further work. But it does give us this interesting, he does give us this interesting picture of how communication works, which is I think reminiscent of uh, a bit in the blue book. Uh, language translation, says Collins, language translation or just plain conversation within one natural language consists of three stages. Stage one, inscription. In telling, the attempt is made to represent lived meaning with the inscribed string. For example, in the case of conversation, an attempt is made to represent the meaning, so what it is one's thinking, I suppose, one attempts to represent that meaning as a string comprising vibrations of the air. Stage two, transmission and transformation, and then stage three, so transmission and transformation, that's kind of causal stuff. Stage three, interpretation. This is the attempt to recreate meaning from the string, to interpret it. What seems to be interesting about this picture of, of meaning is it sounds kind of 17th century to me. Uh, and I'm reminded of that, that bit in the, the, the blue book, the signs of our language seem dead without these mental processes, and it might seem that the only function of the signs is to induce such processes, mental processes, and that these are the things we ought really to be interested in. We're tempted to think that the action of language consists of two parts, an inorganic part, the handling of signs, strings, and an organic part, which we may call understanding these signs, meaning them, interpreting them, and thinking. So it's that organic part <coughs> in stages one and three, 
of, uh, of Collins's account. Uh, but what's really interesting is that Collins used to be a, a great reader of Wittgenstein, and so it's interesting <coughs> to have fallen prey to the very picture that I mean, Wittgenstein is here critiquing, criticising. I also think that that shows us the cost of adopting this account of tacit knowledge. Um, forgive me if I've said this before, but uh, I think of uh, philosophy as a kind of accounting scene. So it, it doesn't tell us what we ought to think. It tells us the cost of thinking what we, what we want to think. And I think the accountancy costs of this book are going to be high because we're going to have to do the thing that Collins at the moment can't do, which is explain how it is that strings sometimes know its meaning and how that works. And we're going to have to come up with an account that dovetails with this, this story about communication. And that all seems a big ask to me. So <coughs> here's my summary of how we lose knowledge if we're trying to give an account of tacit knowledge following Collins. A fear of the regress of interpretations in Wittgenstein leads to a naturalistic concentration on strings, which are bits of stuff inscribed with patterns connected by good old cause and effect. Then elaboration, transformation, mechanization, and explanation all count as instances of explication, and hence is what is explicit. And so there we get a concentration on processes, not on knowledge, task as task, rather than the way humans work, the way we think. And hence we have an account of ontology, processes, the world unfolding, not epistemology. It's an account pitched at the level of reference, not, a, not an account pitched at the level of sense. And so I just don't think it addresses the challenge of balancing tacit and knowledge in the account of tacit knowledge. That's my worry, I suppose. Mm. I'm also worried, I mean, to repeat, it seems that the way the world unfolds counts both as tacit knowledge and as explicit knowledge. I just can't get my head around that. Okay, so we are right at the bottom. Just a final little thing. Uh, I should have brought the playing cards. Phil and I will be just sitting down at the front in just a few minutes. The alarm bells won't ring. The film just comes to an end. I, sometimes I end rather well, I should say. You see, that, that's the reason for... Sometimes I end with a kind of climax. There is a sentence that, that, I, that I, it's just not going to happen. I'm telling myself more than I'm telling you. So I was also giving just a little moment to breathe whilst... And here we go. Okay. <laughs> so what should we do about thinking about tacit knowledge? Well, I don't think there's a brilliant approach one possibility might be to think that it was a mistake to, be, to embark on this whole notion in the first place. But I'm not going to do that yet, because I think there was something in the air in Anglophone uh, philosophy in the, in the 1950s. Polanyi was there, but Wittgenstein and Ryle. And I, I want to hear something in tacit knowledge about the primacy of the practical. That's, that's the clue to which I want to cling. So... We could concede that neither strings nor signs have meanings essentially. That's one of the points that Collins makes, and that's what makes them concentrate on strings. But rather than inventing a new ontology of strings and then worrying about how we can connect those back to meaning, uh, to do that we will have to provide some substantive philosophical theory of meaning, perhaps a causal theory of meaning, perhaps we could go all teleosemantic. That all seems really hard work. Why not instead contrast tacit knowledge with what can be put into words given a linguistic community? I mean, that's an amazing contingency that we are linguistic creatures. But given that we are linguistic, uh, uh, linguistic creatures, let's just embrace that and say what's explicit is what's conveyed by signs, i.e. what can be linguistically codified. Let's make that the explicit. And then the tacit is going to be a suitable antonym of that. And then I think it's helpful to recall the examples of chick sexing, knowing how to tell a male chick from a female chick, Polynesian navigation, knowing how to get home with one's fish, TA laser building, knowing how to build a working laser. And think of tacit knowledge as a piece of, of know-how. Connect the tacit knowledge literature to the know-how literature. So this picks up that other clue from Polanyi, from his book, Personal Knowledge. I regard knowing as an active comprehension of things known, an action that requires skill. Use that as the clue. If, if so, we get something like tacit knowledge is <coughs> context-dependent, conceptually structured, practical knowledge. That's the thought. Well, 
we, we know that if, if uh, something's going to count as tacit knowledge, it's got to be tacit, it's got to be knowledge. Is this tacit? Well, it's not as tacit as we might have wanted it to be. Frankly, it isn't weird enough. It's not tacit in the way that the philosophers tell the story of the chick sexes, namely that they are weirded out by their own crazy ability. It's not tacit like that. And if that's what we wanted by way of tacit knowledge, this suggestion won't work. But if instead we think that the Japanese chick sexes have tacit knowledge, and interestingly, the Australians don't have the right eyes to see it, then we could go with something like this. They know in the context how to, how to sex the, the chicks, and the knowledge that they so express fits into the rest of their account of what happens to chickens, their understanding of maleness and femaleness and so on. But there's a crucial practical element, which is you've got to know how to squeeze the things, because I take it as a, a squeeze and a peer. You've got to know how to squeeze the things. And even when you do squeeze them and show them to your Australian colleague, he or she doesn't have the right eyes to see. So you've got to have a, a receptive ability as well as a practical ability. So it's not as tacit as Polanyi sometimes seems to say. I don't have time today to describe this, but one of Polanyi's examples of tacit knowledge is the knowledge that, uh, 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 that a, a surgeon has of human anatomy. And Pol Polanyi tries to balance the idea that a series of segments through the body connected with how we know how they line up would determine the organs, the positions of the organs in the body, and yet at the same time wouldn't be explicit. So Polanyi tries to balance this notion that, tacit, that the surgeon <coughs> has tacit knowledge in a very strange way that, again, I don't quite follow. But that, whatever it is, wouldn't fit this, connecting tacit knowledge to practical ability. And the reason for doing this, I think, is, is, is motivated, as I say, by something in the early 1950s, the regress arguments found in Ryle and Wittgenstein, more recently in Dreyfus in the What Computers Can't Do, pushing the priority of the practical, arguing against the new intellectualism of, say, uh, uh, Stanley and, and uh, Williamson. Now, if we're doing this, on this account, just as a, as a flag <coughs> uh, a signpost, we're McDowellian rather than Dreyfusian. It's Catching the frisbee in the park, in McDowell's example, is exercising a conceptual capacity for us. So that, there's a whole other discussion going on there. But here's the thing I wanted to mention today, because uh, one of the reasons why one might not want to talk about tacit knowledge at all is one might think that tacit knowledge is illicitly explanatory. It's, it's explanatory in a way which is cheating. And I don't think we should think of tacit knowledge like that. Here's a way of thinking of tacit knowledge as explanatory. This comes, these quotes are from uh, Collins's uh, great book, Changing Order. And there's an introduction in which he connects what he's going to say about tacit knowledge to Wittgenstein and, and the rules regress. And he asks the question, he considers asking the question, what comes after 2468? Giving the following as, as the immediate answer. He says, the immediate answer that springs to mind is 10, 12, 14, 16. And to all intents and purposes, this is indeed the, scare quotes, correct answer. But then he worries about what it is that underpins that as the correct answer, <coughs> pointing out among, uh, on the way that go on in the same way allows for a number of different possibilities. And he says it's not possible fully to specify the rule. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. No, indeed, indeed. Uh, so, so his thought is because it's infinite, he hasn't done. He hasn't done. Okay. So since in spite of the fact that it's not fully possible to specify the rule, you can, you can specify finite rules, he thinks, but you can't specify the ones that go on and on and on. Since in spite of this, we all know the correct way to go on, there must be something more to a rule than its specifiability. And then there are three suggestions for what that extra bit is. Social entrenchment, shared form of life, and tacit knowledge. So in Collins's early work, tacit knowledge is explanatory. The thought is that in explaining what a rule is, there's a gap. We haven't fully explained it. That gap then has to be filled by, by tacit knowledge. <coughs> tacit knowledge as <coughs> explanatory. Uh, it fills in the gap for, the, for early Collins. 
And the worry about that surely is that that will make understanding private. We're all filling in the thing which is out there in the public realm, namely explanations of rules, which, and those explanations aren't going far enough to specify anything. And so we're, we're all rapidly sotto voce filling in bits of tacit knowledge. But since what's tacit in this, at this point is what isn't explicit, then the tacit knowledge is not something that we can compare. So we're all filling in with potentially divergent forms of tacit knowledge. And that seems to me to be a dreadful way of reading what's going on here. So I don't think we should think of tacit knowledge as filling in a gap between explanations of rules and our understanding of those rules. I don't think we should think of it as filling in that gap. I think we should think that the tacit knowledge is in the way in which we take those explanations of rules. In our unfolding practice of going on, that's tacit knowledge. So at each stage, when I write down the next digit, I know in this context that this is the digit to write down. That's it being context dependent, but conceptually structured because I'm unfolding the plus two rule. So in thinking of tacit knowledge in this way and in making some connection to the rule following considerations, I'm not saying it's explanatory. It's not filling in a gap. It's descriptive rather than explanatory. Two slides and then I'll stop. Uh, in, in his really interesting book, uh, sort of outlining a kind of transcendental idealism, thinking about Wittgenstein in connection to it, Adrian Moore uh, gives an account of ineffability. And again, for full disclosure, I should quickly say this. Adrian Moore has a really complicated account of the difference between tacit knowledge and inevitability in a really pregnant footnote. Uh, this, do you mean ineffability? Ineffability. Oh, sorry, I thought you said inevitability. Oh, sorry, if I did, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. I've been talking too long. I'm about to finish. Uh, so so in, in flagging up more on ineffability, I shouldn't be saying that this is more on, on tacit knowledge. It isn't. He's got this other thought. It's a really, it's a great footnote. Uh, but, but maybe this will do just in this context to think about one of the reasons why, <laughs> again, I'm just, I'm just sort of thinking about tacit knowledge and the rule following considerations. So this is what Moore says about, about grasping the meaning of a word. He says, my understanding of English is a prime example I certainly count that as ineffable, even though it includes large tracts of effable knowledge, such as that the word green denotes green things. It includes my knowing how to exercise the concept of green, for instance, for instance, which in turn includes my knowing what it is for something to be green. So hence I'm thinking of rule following considerations here. But this is not the same as my having an answer to any question. Still less is it the same as my having an answer to the pseudo-question, what is it for something to be green? So more here, I've got one more paragraph on more coming up, but what more here is suggesting is that when you know how to go on in the is green rule, you have a piece of ineffable knowledge because there is no content that can be put into words which is the content of that knowledge. And for that reason, more thinks that this this is an interesting instance of, of knowledge, but ineffable. Let me give you, in a, in a paper that came out uh, a few years later, he deploys this against Stanley and Williamson. Uh, Stanley and w Williamson, who are uh, mounting, an, uh, as it were, a rearguard action against Ryle, a rearguard action against the priority of the practical, an argument that knowing how is really a subspecies of knowing that. that that's the context for them. And Moore says, on their view, uh, okay, well, I'm, we just have to go for this and we'll pick up the, the, the reference for this. This is knowledge concerning something, that that thing is what it is for an object to be green. <coughs> but concerning what? A simple reply would be, what is it for an object to be green? But what kind of a thing is that? If I, to, if I try to express my knowledge by indicating a green object and saying, this is what it is for an object to be green, what can I be referring to by this? There does not seem to be any good answer. Nothing short of an unacceptable Platonism, it seems to me, can subserve the extension of their account to this case. I do not think that my knowledge of what it is for an object to be green is knowledge that anything is the case, nor crucially do I think that it's effable. So the thought is that one can't say what being green is consists in, short of pointing to a platonic extension. And since we can't do that, 
there is no way of putting this knowledge into words. That's, that's Moore's concern here. But it seems to me, it seems to me that we could just think that this is an instance of tacit knowledge. The unfolding of the is green rule in context is the unfolding of our practical mastery of that concept. So it's a conceptually structured practical ability which depends on the, on the, the context, this instance. Now, I get really cross if I were to try to explain to little Ludwig what the color green was, and I pointed to some green things, and he said, short of showing you the platonic extension, you show me nothing, Father. There, there would be much slapping at that point. So for us, with eyes to see, one has indeed said, said what it is for something to be green by pointing to the green thing. That's the explication of the is green rule. So, final slide. So, so here's the thought. So if we think that tacit knowledge is context-dependent, conceptually structured, practical knowledge, it's not explanatory, but there is a connection to the rule-following uh, discussion. The difficulty we have, I have anyway, is balancing, in balancing the tacit and the, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge status, it's balancing an account of what's explicit in giving, in, in uh, um, manifesting knowledge of a rule, in explaining a rule to somebody else. What's explicit and what's left implicit. And I think, and this is the bit where I'm going to, I'm shortly about to stop, but this, this is my confusion. This is the thing that I can sort of never rest easy with. In Charles Travis's really interesting account of what makes the rule following considerations as difficult as they are, there's a balance of what he describes as a prior understanding. So my, my, um, my knowing everything that I now know about the plus two rule with my novel understanding, which is supposing that I persuade uh, uh, Anna here to give me a figure, any figure. In fact, I'm going to do it. Give me a figure, Anna. Four. Six, I go, bold as anything. Now, in that six, I manifest novel understanding. Here's a situation with which I had no knowledge by acquaintance, a situation about which I couldn't form any singular <coughs> thought. It was in the future. I had only prior understanding of it. And the, the Travisian thought goes, it's, it's in the connection from prior understanding to novel understanding that we see the potential of the gap and the gap being closed by us as the creatures that we are, creatures who can, as a matter of contingent fact, follow, follow rules. So whether one is impressed by this as a gap or not, it seems to me, turns on whether one thinks that there's a kind of transcendental reading of the rule-following considerations or an empirical one. What is the possibility of the deviant student who gets all these things wrong? Is that an empirical possibility? Or is it merely a transcendental possibility deployed to undermine a Platonistic explanation about how rules operate? Okay. So my thought is, is, is this, that the connection between tacit knowledge and rule following is that rule following can be articulated in the middle of things to those with eyes to see. But what we're doing when we're doing that is exemplifying tacit knowledge because it's at the cutting edge of the rule that something novel in Travis's sense is happening. And so I think there is a connection, just not an explanatory connection, between rule following and tacit knowledge. And that's, I think, why we both need tacit knowledge, and yet at the same time, there's a big history of rejecting it, saying, no, no, there's no such thing.